So thank you and, um, and hello everybody. My name is Rob Hine and I'm the Head of Trade and Partnerships at BSI. Um, I'd like to thank Man and Machine for giving me the opportunity to present at their summit today uh, around the topic of the value of BIM certification. Um, I mean, I've been presenting on uh, at, at different trade shows and, and other events uh, throughout the sort of past five or six years uh, on certification. And I think it's fair to say that there's still some confusion around uh, the, the certification landscape. Uh, and uh, and you know not just what certification is, but uh, how it how it can actually add real value to to organisations. So I hope that I can I can put a bit of clarity around that for you today. Um, before we get into into the detail of that, I thought it might be useful to give a, a very very top level overview of, of BSI and who we are. Uh, so within the BSI group, this is this is more or less how we are we're structured today. There are a few more departments and divisions within the BSI group that I've, I've not put in here because they're not particularly relevant to today's discussion. But I think it's useful to explain the demarcation around, the, around these two sides here on the left. Uh, the knowledge side, we have um, the UK National Standards Body. Now their primary function is to, is to facilitate the development of standards across all different industry sectors. And they're supported by by other functions around knowledge solutions on that side uh, of the organization. Uh, on the right hand side there in the darker red, we have the assurance side of BSI, uh, where we help organizations to maximize the value of, of these standards to help them to <clears throat> embed them into their organizations as effectively and efficiently uh, as possible through a number of different mechanisms like training and certification would be the, the two obvious ones. Um, I sit on the assurance side of the business, but I do work with in collaboration with my with my colleagues on the knowledge side. But I think it's important to say um, there is a very strict code of practice about how those two divisions within BSI work together uh, and can collaborate. Uh, and uh, and we we abide by those regulations very strictly. Uh, and um, and uh, one of the most important factors is that from the assurance side of the business, we cannot benefit commercially from the work that's carried out on the, on the knowledge solution side but as i say we do we do work together uh, where it's um, where it's in the interest of our clients we are not a government organization some people believe that we are um, we operate under this um, this royal charter you can see the, the crest down there in the bottom left uh, and this enables us to to be um, completely independent because we don't have shareholders. We're a non-profit distributing organisation, so profit that we do make is put back into the business to to help us uh, support industry and develop uh, new and innovative solutions moving forwards. Uh, and uh, this lack of uh, shareholder intervention enables us to be very agile, very innov innovative. Uh, and, and very robust in the in the in the work that we carry out in the, in that, that arena. Uh, I couldn't let the the opportunity pass without talking a bit about the the global pandemic and the massive impact that that's had. Uh, BSI are, are doing what we can to support our clients and and the wider industry through uh, facilitating the availability of, of certain standards, certain applicable standards. Uh, working with the EPC in uh, generation of some some um, some supportive webinars and creating some new solutions as well around um, hygienic workplace and premises and uh, supporting solutions that enable organizations to 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 restart and um, and and react to the current situation and get back to work uh, if you'd like to know more about about those uh, solutions um, you can contact me through man and machine or, or go onto our website and and search the covid19 response Focusing on the built environment, um, I mean, our roots have always been in, in the construction industry. We were set up by Sir John Wolfe Barry, who was uh, twice president of the Institute of Civil Engineers and principal architect on the building of, of Tower Bridge in London and uh, in 1901 to support the steel industry. And uh, we've been working with the, with the built environment and construction industry ever since. Moving forward to today, we're focusing very heavily on on uh, those key issues in the built environment around health, safety and well-being, sustainability, obviously digital transformation we'll be talking about today. Um, supply chain management is a really interesting one and then and then uh, moving forward into innovation. And obviously these five uh, um, categories here are the, the, the mega trends that we see in the built environment globally uh, all, all really come under that banner of resilience. 
And we work with clients throughout the whole asset life cycle from um, inception, design, through build, operation, and then ultimately into decommissioning. So um, I put here that, that BSI are not the BIM police. Uh, I think what, I, what I'm really trying to say here is that we work in partnership with, with our clients and other stakeholders. Um, we want to, to be a supportive partner in, in, the, in, the, in the process of compliance and assurance, certification, training, development of standards. And um, also when we're, when we're looking at creating solutions and, um, and services for, for industry and for our existing clients and beyond, we, we do it in a very collaborative way. So we, we don't just go off and uh, design what we think is a solution uh, we like to talk to um, to everybody in the supply chain uh, to make sure that any any solutions we do come up with are, are the right solutions that they're fit for purpose and that they add real value uh, not just to to our potential clients but to to other to to their stakeholders both up and down the supply chain as well and we found this is a very effective way of creating the right solutions for industry this is our view of um, of a typical BIM journey it starts very simply with the with the down on the left hand side there with uh, buy and read the BIM standard and I, I think you'd probably be surprised uh, how many people skip that step I would strongly advise that, that you don't do that but when you when you have done what you'll probably find is that um, it um, it's not so easy to interpret the requirements of the standards into business as usual how do you take those um, those requirements and embed them into an organization that fits with your incumbent processes and systems and also works towards your your strategic uh, objectives both near term and long term uh, so you're probably going to need a bit of outside assistance there and you can do that through looking for organizations who can provide training uh, as BSI do or you can work with uh, with consultants such as man and machine uh, who can who can help you with that process and they can they can help you to to understand how to implement those standards you may consider after that 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 process uh, and when you feel that you you have the the standards embedded and they're working for you rather than against you that you might want to go on through to to certification uh, and the process of that would be either using uh, using a consultant like man and machine to help you to get to uh, get certification ready or you could uh, undertake a gap and a gap assessment uh, with the certification body uh, such as bsi who can assess you against the requirements of those standards so where you are now uh, and produce a, a readiness report that will tell you where you need to be. Once you, once you have that information, you can then move on to um, what we call a stage one assessment, where we would come in and assess you uh, against the requirements of that standard uh, to, to ensure um, that, that uh, you're meeting those requirements and you're embedding them effectively, and then through to a stage two and certification. You can see, uh, although probably not read down the left hand side there, some of the Kite Mark certification schemes that, that we've created to date. So looking at those in a bit more detail, um, we we're using the the kite mark as our as our certification device, and I'm sure that uh, most of you, if not all of you, are familiar uh, with the BSI kite mark. It has been around for a long time, and I'll talk about that in a bit more detail later on. Um, but to the just to go through them sort of one by one, we've got uh, <coughs> BIM design and construction, which was originally uh, against the uh, uh, PAS 1192 standard. Part two, we have uh, BIM for asset management, BIM for security, BIM health and safety, a BIM project, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail, uh, and BIM objects. And they will follow that, that principle of a sort of plan, do, check, act, uh, and a very pragmatic approach to certification. We, as I said before, it's very much a partnership. Uh, we work with our clients to help them through that process uh, from where they are to where they need to be in order to gain to gain that certification. So now moving on to the to the um, the subject matter in hand is what what's the value of certification? Why why would you bother going through the process of certification? Uh, there are a number of different reasons why organisations choose to do this, and we've broken them down into into sort of subcategories here. Um, and I'm going to go through these kind of one at a time to talk about them in a bit more detail. But uh, as a top level overview, organizations would choose certification for differentiation, 
to um, ensure that they're maximizing the benefits of, of BIM within their organization, reducing risk, increasing revenue, <coughs> enhancing their brand, and, uh, and to gain market access. Let's look at uh, maximizing the benefits of BIM as a starting point. So I don't want to talk too much about the, um, the value that BIM can bring because I think that, that's been well um, well explored uh, and I think most organizations are aware of the fact that uh, that uh, BIM does represent real benefit and real value. If, if you do need to know more uh, about the, the actual value that BIM can provide for your organization because of course the values that we see from BIM are dependent upon what the organization does uh, ranging from whether you're a client or a, a designer, a tier one contractor or a supplier or anywhere in between in that supply chain. Those values may, may be slightly different, but I think they are, they're all of a common theme, but there's lots of information out there and I'll talk a little bit later on about where you'll be able to find, um, find information and actually do self-assessments uh, of your organization uh, as well to see where the value would lie. Uh, but I think the point that I'd like to make here about the, the value that certification can bring is really about here is about um, getting a third party expert organization like B, BSI into your organization to implementation process. So as I mentioned a couple of times before, the BSI we partner with our clients. So we're not the we're not the BIM police. We don't just come in and say, well you haven't done that right. So we, we can't pass you and therefore you can't you can't have a certificate. Um, it's very much a partnership and collaborative approach, walking you through through the process as much as we're able to as a certification body. Uh, and uh, and helping you to get from where you are to where you need to be as all as part of that audit and and, and uh, reporting process. But the, one of the other values that that uh, Kite Mart certification brings is that it's not just assessment of capability. In order to gain uh, a BSI Kite Mark, we have to look for evidence that um, that these BIM processes are being used uh, in real time and in real life. So we'll we'll look at certain projects and we'll we'll assess whether the BIM processes are are part of business as usual, uh, or whether they're just being managed at certain certain um, uh, certain periods and and um, certain parts of that implementation process. Um, so it's it's very much focused on output. It's very much about uh, helping organisations to achieve those maximum be benefits in in a very effective and efficient way. But again, as part of that process, uh, if you if you maximise those benefits of BIM, uh, it will lead to a reduction of risk uh, and um, in most cases an increase in revenue or, or certainly uh, a decrease in cost, which leads to increased uh, operating profit. Um, that increase in revenue, of course, is linked to those other uh, blue circles that we have there, brand enhancement, market access and differentiation. So let's look at those in a little bit more detail now. Um, brand en enhancement's an interesting one. I think in order to explore that in detail, we have to take a step back and look at, uh, at what the kite mark is and the value that the kite mark itself can bring. So <clears throat> the kite mark itself was uh, was established as a as a trademark back in 1903, uh, and has been used as a as a certification mark and a mark of trust uh, over the last 117 years. Uh, uh, most of that time, it's been focused on product approval, and you can see there are a very small selection of uh, of the types of products that um, enjoy the benefit of kite mark certification. Uh, and it is actually, uh, of course, a global certification mark. So we uh, we use it, and we'll talk a little bit more about market access later on. But uh, our clients uh, come come from many different countries globally, uh, and uh, they use the kite mark for for a number of different reasons. But we realised that uh, when we were looking at the value of kite mark um, a few years ago, that uh, we didn't need to restrict it um, at that value just to products. We could widen it out to uh, to services and and to processes uh, with with equal effect, uh, and I think that the the value that the kite mark has um, around the globe is is really due to two factors, and the first one is the fact that it's been around for a very long time, uh, so people people do recognise it. We had extremely high uh, recognition factors of the kite mark here in the UK, uh, of um, of around about the sort of mid sixty percent. Uh, of consumers recognize the kite mark 
uh, and they also trust it as well, which I think is much more important than recognition. Um, and uh, and the second thing about the kite mark is is uh, the fact that the the integrity with which we we operate the, the certification process within BSI. Uh, we, we pride ourselves on that integrity. It's linked back to what I was talking before about uh, operating under Royal Charter and, and giving us that, um, that objective integrity that's required for a really robust certification process. And that, that you know, the, the real value of the kite mark in brand enhancement is uh, when you apply <clears throat> a kite mark to a product, or, or use in association with a, with an organisational brand, it brings with it all of that incumbent trust. It's what uh, what marketing teams call transferable brand equity. So uh, people trust the kite mark; they see it, they recognise it, and they trust it. Uh, rightly so, uh, and therefore they 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 apply that trust to any particular product or organisation that's associated with with the kite mark, and that's a very um, a very um, tangible benefit that kite mark certification can bring. And I suppose if you, when you when you distill, distill you know the the real value of certification down to its uh, its core value, <laughs> it would be that uh, the fact that people trust it. Uh, and uh, if people are looking for organisations wherever they are in the supply chain uh, who are capable of providing their services in accordance with BIM. Uh, having the kite mark would mean really that they, they do any additional assessment or evaluation of that organisation. Uh, they can instantly recognise uh, compliance through the kite mark uh, certification process and the display of, of that, that, that highly recognisable symbol there. Market access is, a, is an interesting one. We've been looking at uh, global market access in relation to, to kite mark certification for a number of years. Uh, and um, We've seen a real drive uh, with with BIM for for market access globally. Um, when we look at the, um, the 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 global BIM adoption chart here, this is a little bit of a heat map. Uh, you can see on on the uh, the blue shading of the of the map in the background there to see where the adoption of uh, of BIM is at the moment, uh, and you can see different parts of the world now looking at to implement implement mandates uh, for BIM because it because they've recognized what the values of those are. Uh, and um, again, kite mark certification because it is uh, a globally recognized brand can help with that that market access uh, and to to ensure um, that uh, BIM deliverable services that are kite mark certified are recognized as being compliant, not just in the UK, but in, in other parts of the world as well. And that, that will become more prevalent as time goes on. Those uh, light shade blue areas will become darker uh, as, be, as the, the value and the benefits of BIM become more widely recognized. Uh, and, the, and the international standard will, of course, help to drive that, that global adoption piece. So um, differentiation uh, is one of the primary reasons that organisations go through the process of, of kite mark certification. There are other certification marks out there, but um, not all of them carry that kind of that kind of brand brand uh, recognition and that transferable brand equity. So for organisations who are looking to to differentiate themselves uh, from competition then kite mark certification is a really effective way to do that. When you couple it with um, this sort of uh, global BIM adoption, you can see there's a really strong driver there to, to, uh, for organisations to go through the certification process uh, and to, to achieve um, the top levels of certification in order to not just demonstrate that they're, that they're BIM compliant, but also to, to differentiate themselves from the competition. Uh, and I'm sure you recognise um, some of the names um, in, in, in that slide there. So we always think it's um, more powerful and uh, more reassuring to hear the value of, um, of something from, from people that are using it rather than people who are providing it. So I'd just like to share with you some, some comments from our clients about Kite Mark certification, uh, which might help to, to frame uh, what I've been saying a little bit more concisely. Um, so Navel here is talking about um, how the kite marks help them to to improve the way that they they manage their assets for clients, uh, which goes back to what we were saying about um, implementing um, the BIM processes more efficiently and effectively. 
Um, David Thrussell here is talking about reinforcing client confidence. So it's all about um, you know gaining that that level of trust from clients, but also then going on to talk about um, they they can uh, deliver greater quality uh, for BIM projects through through the process of of gaining client and uh, ensuring that they are using the, those BIM processes effectively and efficiently within their within their organization. Uh, Neil Thompson here is talking about um, assurance for clients. And again, going back to what I was talking about before in relation to um, that transferable brand equity that, that the Kite Mark has uh, and how it gives confidence um, to, to your clients and to other stakeholders in the supply chain as well. Um, Mark Taylor emphasizing that point there again, talking about um, uh, how that will the reassurance that that uh, that clients gain, not just through through the um, of the actual kite mark itself, but through the process uh, of, of gaining the kite mark and how how it helps to embed um, within that 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 uh, BIM process within their systems. There, Neil Parkinson here talking about competitive edge. Uh, this is really about um, that differentiation aspect as well. How do you stand out from the crowd? How do you um, demonstrate quickly and easily and effectively uh, that um, that your thought leaders and that you are, um, you know, uh, ahead of the curve and, and that uh, you should be picked ahead of your, your competition? Uh, and really, Kite Mark certification has been used for that at a product level very effectively um, for, for you know the, the uh, for quite a long time. Uh, so um, moving it now into the into this space of, of BIM is a natural progression, uh, and uh, and organisations really are starting to use it to gain that competitive edge and to differentiate themselves from those from their competitors. Uh, and that's exactly what uh, what Alan Harris is is, is saying here: uh, differentiation from competitors and strengthening their position as as a market leader and demonstrating that that level of um, of thought leadership, which is so important. So there is a there's a lot of help and support available uh, for organisations to to help them uh, to educate them, uh, to bring them up to speed, and so that they can they can learn um, more about the processes and, and and how they can be how they can be implemented and uh, how to drive that real value. Um, there's a few of these kind of maturity tools out there that I'm aware of. BSI do one. Um, and it's available from from our website or if you'd like to contact us via man and machine we can we can make a copy available for you uh, and really this is a this is a, effectively a self assessment form which you then send back to BSI and we evaluate the information that you provided uh, and then we will one of our experts will contact you to talk about um, what the next steps might be for your organization so it's a kind of uh, very top level um, desktop assessment of, of uh, organizational progression in, in the, on the BIM journey. And then going back to what I was saying before about where are you on your BIM journey and all the different variables that, that come into play there with um, where you should be on that, on that journey curve. We did also commission uh, this digital transformation report, uh, which again is available either from the website or, or through contacts from Managing Machine. Uh, lots and lots of really useful information in there. And one of the things uh, I think is in the center fold of this, uh, this particular report is a self-assessment um, questionnaire, again, which you can use. You don't have to then send that back to BSI. You can just use that as a, uh, a very top level assessment of um, where you are in relation to BIM adoption. Uh, so that's quite a useful tool, but as I said before, lots of additional information in there as well. But um, I think if you wanted to go to a, a single source of truth, if you want to find out more about um, about BIM, uh, then absolutely you should go to the UK BIM Framework um, uh, portal. Uh, that's the address there, ukbimframework.org, um, which was an initiative uh, between BSI, Centre for Digital Built Britain and the UK BIM Alliance. And there is a lot of information on there, uh, which I, I guarantee you will find useful. You can also access the standards from, from that site as well. And then, of course, we have um, we have our associate consultants program, of which Man and Machine are, are of course, a member. Uh, and um, you know, we 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 as a certification body, BSI, we're not not permitted to provide consultative services. Uh, although we do partner and collaborate through the certification process, there are things that we 
can't tell you we can't tell you how to meet the requirements of a standard and then assess you to, to see if you've met the requirements of that standard it's a poacher gamekeeper situation uh, although there are lots of things that we, we can support with um, but if you need the requirements of a, of a, of a, uh, a consultant then uh, we, we created this membership um, program uh, which is by invitation only where we uh, like to um, ass not assess but um, we put together a uh, a group of consultants who are have demonstrated competence for, against particular standards so that we have confidence ourselves as a certification body in referring them on um, to those to those particular clients so lots of information out there I would urge you to to seek that information and to educate yourself as much as possible um, and then um, and then engage with the experts to, to, to move forward quickly. Uh, so thank you very much for your time. Uh, I really appreciate it. And thank you again to Man and, and Machine for giving me the opportunity to present to you today on uh, on this topic of certification. Thanks, Rob. Um, I um, just want to introduce myself quickly to sort of finish off this session around the value of certification. Uh, I will introduce myself again later uh, at the next session, but just for those people that perhaps are not looking at this session and are just going to join the upskilling session. So uh, very quickly, my name is Phil Reed. I am the Managing Director of Man and Machine. So I'm going to talk to you very specifically about getting ready for certification. Um, we've understood what the value of certification is. What is the process of getting ready? I guess that depends to a large extent where you are in the process. But we have a fairly well-trodden, uh, fairly robust process of helping people on their journey. And we've done this for a number of clients. I can think off the top of my head of a very large uh, baggage handling company where we help them uh, get ready and get to the point where they could deliver digital and BIM projects uh, for specifically for one of the larger airports in the UK. Uh, we've more recently done some work for a very large MEP company. And uh, this is really the process that we follow, which is really, as I say, getting you ready to the point to be able to deliver projects and for some of you wanting to go through the certification process. So um, let me start by just showing you the first slide. Uh, this is the slide. It really talks about our readiness program. So how do we go about helping somebody on their digital journey? And this is, as I've already said, a fairly robust process. Uh, and it really goes through several phases. So obviously the first thing we do is we start with uh, what it is somebody's trying to do. Why are we trying to be certified? What is the point? Or in fact, let me ask you a more simple question. What is the point of, of, take, of de trying to implement a BIM program within your organization? And I think that really depends. Uh, we often hear that customers want to embark upon BIM because their customers are asking for it. And, and quite frankly, that's a very laudable reason for doing it. We all need to win more business to keep our companies going and growing. Um, but doing it just for that sake, I think, is probably missing an opportunity. Because if you really believe in the value of data, if you really believe in information interoperability, and if you really believe in the digitization process, then it can do a lot more for your organization. It can also help you um, drive efficiency, improve productivity, deliver projects in a more timely fashion. And um, this robust process that I've mentioned really it starts at the very beginning with an assessment. And when we're trying to assess an organization for BIM readiness and understand what they need to do to get to the state they want to be in, that is a very important part. And that involves executive engagement. It involves uh, you spending some time with us uh, to really get the most value out of this, this journey that you're going to go on. So we would usually start with an assessment. And during that assessment, we're going to start talking to you about your organization's digital or BIM strategy. We're going to look at BIM use cases. So there's many things you can do uh, in a BIM project. So if you're going to start thinking about, you know, in, in the sort of the current way around implementing ISO 19650, uh, what use cases do you actually want to use the technology for? Because that's an important part of the journey that will take you on. Um, you can see at the bottom uh, a spider graph which talks about these things. It goes on to talk about your current process. So we'd really need to understand that in some detail. 
Uh, how you manage information today? What is your workflow for managing information? How do you secure information? How do you share information? Uh, we'll also think about your infrastructure. Is it ready uh, for the kind of work you're going to be doing uh, if you are going to adopt ISO 19650, which is, is what you've heard about from Richard in an earlier session? And of course, most importantly, we're going we're gonna to think about personnel, capability, uh, risk, and all of those things, but really to do with the organizational uh, readiness um, of your business to, to sort of go on this journey. So that's well where, where we'll start. Uh, it usually then starts with us defining some very simple sometimes documents, but actually really important documents. So a BIM policy document, for example, um, that might manifest itself in many cases uh, as a BIM manual, for example. Um, what is the BIM strategy? So help define that because a lot of what you need to do as you take your organizations on these journey is motivate and communicate with staff in the right way. So we need to understand uh, and define what your BIM strategy is going to be and, and make sure that that is taken through the organization. Uh, once we've done that top level work, we then need to get into the very detailed work of defining and creating documents, um, BIM project documents, if you will, um, which align to ISO 19650. So as you can see here, that can mean many things. This is this is just an example in front of you. In fact, what I did before I came on to this session was I asked one of our consultants who has recently done one of these projects to talk to me a little bit about some of the documentation that we would produce as we are going through this um, this process of getting you ready for certifi certification because you know one of the one of the things that will happen when you're audited is they will come and look at your documentation how you do things how you run projects and so on and so forth so you really have to have documentation that is aligned to the current standards that they're going to be aud auditing you to and uh, I asked the consultant to actually, as I say, give me some examples. So uh, this was the large MEP company that I talked about, and I, he gave me a list of all the documentation and manuals that we produced to get them ready for delivering digital projects, BIM projects, whichever terminology you want to use. So um, I, I've got the list right in front of me here, uh, and some of the examples are... Um, basically CAD manuals, that's obvious, um, but also supplier EIR, exchange information requirements documents, uh, information risk documents. Um, in the current standards, you also need things like mobilization checklists. Uh, you need uh, PIP or project implementation plan documents, uh, mainly assessment documents around your resource capability, your IT, your BIM capability. Uh, you'll need to have templates and documents for tasks, so task information delivery plans if you want to use the right terminology, project execution plans, and so on and so forth. And they also produced, a, they called the original BIM strategy document a digital delivery policy. So um, they're the kind of documents that we would produce um, or work with you to produce to get you ready to do your certification. Uh, and finally, of course, uh, to, to complete the journey, this is not really about certification itself, but you know, part of that program of activity that you would need to undertake might actually involve, in some cases, you taking on new software. Uh, and that software would need to be thought through uh, in terms of your BIM use cases, which I talked about earlier, and we would need to select your software, uh, your data management environments, or common data environments, as it's called in the, in the, uh, the world of uh, digitization in, in BIM uh, and they're the kind of things that we will need to start to uh, help you deploy, install and be competent to use on a BIM project. Okay so that really sort of takes you or gives you some insight into the kind of things that we would do to help you uh, get to the point of, of being certified by a company like BSI. Uh, one of those things obviously might be software training and I think uh, this is really just an ideal opportunity to talk to you about um, the training program that you might go on um, very briefly. Uh, so let me just quickly talk about that. We have a program that we run across Europe. It's called the BIM Ready program. Uh, it's designed to really help organizations adopt um, BIM processes Particularly, our courses now are fully aligned to ISO 19650. So um, the, they, they really fall into three areas. The first one is the modeling itself. So modeling, coordination, uh, quality control of the models, quality control of data are all important parts of the modeling 
process that you go through. So uh, we have BIM modeler courses. We also have BIM coordination courses. So this is using the typical technologies you might use in a BIM workflow for the coordination activity. Uh, in this instance, for example, we might use Navisworks, we might use uh, Celebri, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, we might also use things like BIM 360 Coordinate, working with Navisworks if you want to sort of talk about the Autodesk world. So we would help you with that kind of training on how to use those tools effectively for clash detection and coordination. The final piece is the kind of workflow piece, which we call BIM Manager or BIM Management. So we have a number of courses here that will help you really understand the concepts and principles that Richard was talking about this morning, funny enough. So um, we start off with a fundamentals course, uh, which is designed to give you the basic things like terminology, um, strategy, uh, really just understanding the different organizations, the documents that are really involved in a BIM project, but at a very high level. Uh, the second course is the BIM and Digital Construction course. That's really for um, helping people that are really involved in a project. So anything from designers to consultants to project managers and so on and so forth. So it's really about helping you really understand the process and the workflow. And we have a very interactive course that allows you to um, engage with other people on the course and actually start to create some of the documentation that I've already alluded to. So that's a very exciting um, course. It's very engaging. It's very interactive. So highly recommend if you're really needing to learn about the BIM project and how it's implemented that you, you go on that two-day course. We also have a, a course for product manufacturers, as you can see, but it's more around building models because they're part of the supply chain of a digital project. And the fourth and final course on that BIM management track is really the Kobe and IFC fundamentals. So you're going to see a lot coming out in industry. In fact, I'm going to talk a little bit about this in the next session um, around data interoperability because it's very important that you understand that when you are doing a BIM project, it's the data that's really important. It's really the data that is used throughout the life cycle of the built asset or the built environment. Um, it's often referred to as the golden thread. Um, and so we really get into that area when we talk about Kobe and IFC, which are really is really about data exchange and data structure. So how we how we exchange information on a BIM project. So that's the sort of bones of our BIM Ready uh, training program, and uh, it's fairly obvious, I guess, uh, when you when you look at that that um, as you go up the stack, you. You go from sort of the modeling side, the kind of hands-on software side, up to the management side and all the steps in between. And I will just say one thing about the course because it kind of it's really important to highlight this as you start to think about your BIM journey, think about getting to certification is um, the program really has... A, a number of components to it. We talk about people, we talk about process, of course we talk about guidelines and we talk about technology and all of these things are important um, but there's a reason that the two bubbles process and people are bigger and the reason they're bigger is they're actually the most important and it's fairly easy to write some guidelines, create templates. There are actually templates you can use out there. Um, we will obviously help create templates as we consult and take people through this process. But it's the people and the implementation of the process that's important. And that involves change management. It is a change management program. And uh, you know it's really important when you think about that is how you're going to implement that, how are you uh, going to communicate, how are you going to get staff to change the way that they're working. These are really important aspects of um, the program that we take you on. So we do have sessions on change management, we talk about strategy, we talk about communication, uh, and it's a reason we get people very involved and engaged in the um, develop, in the training program, in the courses, getting people to interact, because that's really what happens in the real world. So. Um, just really important to understand that, that that principle that it's about people and process change as much as it is about the technology and creating data and all of those kind of things. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's really uh, all I really want to say about uh, the training program. Um, hopefully it's given you some insight into, uh, or this session's given you some insight into not only the value of certification, 
but also the process and some of the aspects you would need to go through to get to the point of feeling that you are confident enough to undertake a certification and of course we'd we'd be very very happy to help you with that you you simply need to get in contact with anyone at the organization and we will do our best to give you the best advice that we can that's why we're here um, that's why we decided to become a BSI consultant uh, because we believe in the certification process and we believe in the value that it can add to an organization and do you know what it may even help you win some business so um, again if you, if you want any help with that then please um, just give me a call with that I will say thank you very much I think we are now no and in fact I know we are now heading into a break and we'll be back in 15 minutes or so with the next session which actually will be me so I look forward to seeing you all in about 15 minutes enjoy your break have a coffee get refreshed and uh, in the next session we'll be talking about upskilling and what we're doing uh, in the UK BIM Alliance which I'm involved in and you'll hear more about that later so um, yeah see you in 15 minutes thanks very much <laughs>